So an introduction to Perl, everything you ever wanted to know in about an hour, <laughs> hour and a half, of Perl. Obviously, I'm not going to do everything, but because it takes practice, you can't learn a programming language or a scripting language by listening to someone talk about it. You actually have to get your hands dirty and get in there and start playing with it. But at least you'll know what kind of tools you need and how to set it up. Perl stands for Practical Extraction and Report Language. It's about as old as Unix is. It was developed in 1986, Larry Wall. Very portable, very friendly uh, to the operating system. Works with the operating system. In fact, a lot of uh, Unix administrators use Perl extensively. It's become a nice little scripting language, more so than shell scripting. So, along with Perl, we have uh, concept of like you know shell scripts that can be created in C and in other scripting type languages. And I'm going to talk about that next week. But Perl actually is a lot more extendable. You can add packages, modules, utilities, and it makes it into a, a fairly functional, nice functioning uh, programming language that you program in the form of a script. So there's no compiled code, it's just a text file, and it comes in very handy. handy. It's also gained wide distribution, is readily available. And the syntax is taken from shell scripts, awk, C programs, so you probably already know the syntax in a lot of different ways. Uh, a bunch of statements and declarations like in a shell script, no main like in C. We'll go through some example code in a few minutes. Each statement ends with a semicolon, kind of like C. Here's the other interesting thing. So at the top of the text file, you open up Notepad or you open up VI or something, you create a text file and you put this on the top. And what does this say? It tells the interpreter in the runtime environment that, hey, this is a Perl program. And it goes out, which means you have to have Perl installed in your Apache server or on your Sun system. It actually comes, in fact, you might even have Perl in your MacBook. I'm not even sure. Do we have Perl? Yeah. Uh, that's not bad. Because uh, a lot of the utilities for the Mac OS X, actually some of the utilities are written in Perl, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's quick language, supports third-party modules. Um, the minus W here is for warnings. And you put this at the beginning of the program, and the server knows that this is a Perl file, finds a Perl interpreter, runs the code. So it's kind of like running a program, except for the runtime environment's not running it, the Perl interpreter is. So it's in a purely interpreted language. Like said in awk, Perl completely parses and compiles the program into an internal format before it actually executes any of it. Reads the instructions processes, it, kind of like PHP if you're familiar with that, um, and then, but PHP is strictly an internet type of language, client server type of environment. Perl will work directly on the server and is used a lot for scripting. So unlike said, not Perl executes sequences of statements exactly once, over and over. So. Some features. There's a rich collection of built-in operators and functions. There's a, supports regular expressions, and if you're not familiar with that, we have an assignment on that that you'll be looking at fairly soon. And there's an entire lecture that I did not go over that is also on regular expressions. I believe it's in the sixes or the sevens. So most of the lectures that you're going to be interested in looking at to help you with the assignments are in the fives through the nines <laughs> series in terms of the numbering. Um, no arbitrary limits on array sizes lengths, contents of strings, uh, comes with symbolic debuggers, has a lot of built-in features to it. And at first, uh, it was used as pattern or scanning, reporting languages, um, it used for list processing, and then it was used for system administration, still being used for system administration right now, uh, to create background jobs, to create all sorts of utilities to organize the Unix platform, run with it client server programming as well, CGI programming for World Wide Web, and that's what that pro that first project is all about. Um, you create a Perl, like a Hello World Perl page essentially, and you run it through a CGI interface, and it kind of gets you familiar with the concept if you set up the tools, that is. But it kind of sh shows you basically how easy it is to write a Perl script and run it. In fact, in the old days, before we had other scripting languages, before we had uh, you know, different utilities out there. The only way to really connect to a website, have some script run on the server, was to go through a CGI, a common gateway interface. What that did is it took you to the server into a secured area <coughs> and ran an executable file for you. And you could write those files in C, C++, Perl, 
other scripting languages. And the beauty of it all was that it all ran on the server, so it took server processing time, and it just came out with the answer and it sped it back out through the CGI port, back out and delivered it to the client, uh, which is what you're going to do in that project if you put it together, if you choose to do it. Um, it's good for database access <coughs> because um, you know you don't want to put in your local client code. You don't want to put you know the login or password to a database. That would be ridiculous. Um, other tasks. Many modules available. The loadable, extendable modules is why Perl is still very popular right now. Module support. Examples would be the CGI interface. Is an example right there. Elda, you know some of the other ones. T TK interfaces. So here's an example. <coughs> So, what do we have here? It's not really doing very much, but we have um, user bin Perl. This is basically telling us use the Perl interface. This is the contents of the text file that we're calling our script. Print, what is your favorite color to the screen? Um, and now we have a variable here with a dollar sign. I'm going to go through all the syntax throughout this course, throughout this lecture, I should say. Um, equals standard input. You look at this going, well, this is actually kind of a scripting notation. So, Perl takes for for system administrators who are so familiar with, or have been for years, familiar with traditional C or C-like scripting languages, Perl lends itself quite well to that and creates an environment where you know they can transfer some of that knowledge, which makes it easier for them. <coughs> um, being able to compare, you know, example the the, the the variable here, you know, if the color is equal to blue, print something out. If the color is equal to black, print something else out. And uh, it basically, and this is kind of an example I'm going to go through today and kind of show you what the parts are and stuff like that. But, it, you know, this is not bad. I mean, it looks pretty much C-like, looks scripty-like. It's not compiled. It's just a text file. So running Perl in Unix, explicit invocation of the program. We type in Perl, space, the options maybe in the program, program arguments. Or we can actually just run the program. So using this at the beginning, this up here, we can put the, the contents of our code into a text file, put this on the header at the top, make the text file executable, and then double click on the text file, essentially, or, or type in the name of the text file, runs it without actually having to bring up the Perl interpreter. Or we can do, you know, type in Perl, press return, say, hey, welcome to Perl, this is version something rather a little prompt. Then we could load the file and run the file there. Uh, so it's a script that runs in the Perl interpreter. It won't run in the regular terminal mode. We actually have to execute the interpreter to get it to work. Um, in debugging mode, we can put a minus D in there as a switch. Interactive debugging for testing, DE. Um, it basically gives us different options in terms of writing the code and testing it simultaneously. In terms of data structures, we have three different types. We have scalars, single-valued variables, arrays, associated arrays, known as hashes. We have like dictionary lookups. And imagine what you could do in terms of string processing, search results processing, um, huge lists, huge pieces of data. Um, it's not bad for extracting information out of it, for you know using it. Hashes are indexed uh, by strings, so we have a lot of built-in functionality that goes on with that. In terms of the Perl data structures, here's some examples here. We have this dollar sign str equals the world is round. This is an example of a string variable. Uh, a dollar sign number. And now you see noticing the dollar sign is giving us a single variable equals uh, 134.99, it's a numeric value. Um, so there's no initialization, there's no declaration, there's it's just, you know, here's a variable, here's a, here's another. And this is very PHP-like, if you're familiar with any of the new, uh, newer languages like PHP. Here's an array. And now you see this at symbol tells you that there's multiple. Is that it's an array symbol. I don't know if that was <coughs> on purpose for A or whether that was something else. I don't know. Why they use a dollar sign? I don't know. That looks like money. String. Money. Arrays. So here we have students, Mike, Lisa, John. And uh, if we print, and we're declaring an array, and I'm going to go through a lot of this and some more examples as well. Print this ID 0, prints out Mike from students. So we get it at arrays the same way as we do. In fact, now we're using the dollar sign to say, hey, this is a, a variable that we're using, a scalar. And we're going to look at 
students index value is zero, the index values again start at zero, go through however long we make it. <coughs> Student three is equal to Julia, add a new element, one, two, zero, one, two, that would be the fourth element. Or empty it. Students equals nothing. Now we've just cleared out the array. So arrays can grow dynamically. Um, they're not set like in C or C++ to a fixed size, or same thing in Java, actually. Um, we can transform, we can add different things, grow it, change types to it. We also have the concept of hashes that also play a part in here. And then we have this kind of, we call it a percent sign, employees so with Julie, President, Mary, VP. <coughs> and then if we said, um, you know, print here uh, this variable, imp, Julie, it's actually going to print out president because Julie was president, Mary was vice president. So it's kind of like a dictionary. Hash is sort of like a dictionary look at where we have a key and a name or a key and a value. So he said, you know, print Julie, it's going to give us president. Uh, print employee Julie, employee John is equal to controller. So now we have John, now controller. We added a new set to it. Or we empty the hash. So we can take this and assign it to nothing, empty set, and then empty it out. Um, we do that because we, you know, let's say we have a bunch of stuff we've read in from search results or something, and we assign it to a hash or something, or we assign it to an array, and then we can add more stuff to the array, or we can move the items around or delete stuff, and then we can just clear the whole thing out without having to like remove each item individually. And if you can imagine how easy this would be for list processing versus using C or C++, a lot more effective uh, for the utility. So strings and numbers, it's two regular variable types. So Perl supports strings and numbers as simplest kinds of data. A scalar, as what they're calling it, uh, is either a number or a string of characters. So a scalar value can be acted upon by operators like the plus or concatenation, yielding the result. So if it's a string, it's going to concatenate it. If it's a number, it's going to actually add it together. And so now we have, uh, and this is actually coming from an MIT reference on a book for Perl. Um, which is very popular. In fact, a lot of other, like a lot of the books out there are based upon this research. And this was the original kind of thought that went into the language, the original uh, research that was associated with it. Scalar values are named with this dollar sign as we've seen before. Even when referring to the scalar that is part of an, an array, we use that as we saw before. Works like the English word the. <coughs> so the days, a uh, simple scalar value for days. The day is 28, which is the 29th element of the array. The day is February from the hash. It's going to return days that are associated with February. Um, the days from the last index value of the array. So using the hash symbol to actually get the index value. So what we put in front of the variable tells us the type of variable, which is kind of interesting. So it's not really a type that we're typing in like like array space something <laughs> we're actually or you know getting at it through something we're, we're using the this kind of syntax so the array and the index slices are denoted by this particular character which works like the these or those where the dollar sign was the uh, the thus or the the so the, we had the these or those if you want to put it into English and then uh, entire hashes are denoted by this percent sign as we've seen so far and the hashes will go key value, key value, key value. Uh, which is interesting. And the hashes of the arrays are basically treated the same way. They can grow dynamically, and you can clear them out the same way as we've seen. Namespaces. Uh, so each variable type has its own namespace. So we can call an array by the same name as we've called the scalar, or a hash, actually. You can use, with fear of conflict, the same name for a scalar, a variable, and array, a hash, a subroutine. Not a good programming practice, but it doesn't limit you. Uh, so you have that flexibility. For example, you can have a foo variable, a foo array, <laughs> two different variables. Interesting. Uh, so they all have their different scope, or namespace scope. In terms of the context, scalar and lists, uh, certain operations return list values and contexts, wanting a list and a scalar otherwise. So it depends on what the variable type is as to what the operators are going to do and what you're going to get as a return. So the operators for numbers, addition, subtraction, multiplication, uh, for integers, a range, 
operator. Just specify the range of numbers, like from 1 to 9, from 0 to something. Operators for strings, we have concatenation, which is the dot, actually, uh, which is more PHP-like or scripting language like than it is other you know other types of languages. Example here would be print hello dot world and put some together. So the dot. You think the plus sign would do it, but it's the dot. So. String repetition, this is the easy, this is the interesting part, which is not supported in very many languages. Uh, string X number that uh, makes X numbers of strings. As an example, Fred three is Fred, Fred, Fred. <laughs> Uh, this is not bad, especially if you get you know errors. How many four? Error, 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 error. <laughs> you can print out errors as many times as you want. And uh, the numerical operators, the, the comparison operator, the not equal, the less than equal. You can use what you're familiar with in some other programming languages, or you can get creative and use the oops the text words for it equals not equals, less than, which is kind of weird if you think about it. You'd think that there would only be one way of doing it, but Perl's kind of like, you know, it's kind of legacy. It has to like support some of the other types of thinking. People aren't necessarily programmers who are doing this. They're business people, they're systems administrators, they're Unix people. So, they have a, they're a different breed. <laughs> so, if you want to use EQ instead of two equals, and then you're more than welcome to. <laughs> Scalar variables. I like those of the I like those of the shell variables, which is where they get their name from. Scalar variable holds a single value, a single scalar value, and it can be assigned any type of value that Perl keeps track of. So Perl will keep track of the type for you. The dollar sign is always used to denote the variable and also to expand the value of the variable. Um, so here's some examples of how to use it. And uh, so the dollar sign variable is equal to value. So this is an assignment. Print this prints out, and this is interesting. This is the regular old C syntax that's into Perl. So Perl actually kind of uses borrows syntax from a couple of different languages. Um, scalar car is equal to Buick. Count is equal to one. No variable types, if you haven't noticed. So we don't give it a type, and it automatically assumes the type by the value that you've assigned to it. So no requirement for declaration or initialization, as I've already mentioned. Pattern matching is also um, part of it. So if the variable equals some pattern, then do something. Uh, so that's built into the kind of the comparison concept. Uh, substitution also works if the variable one is equal to you know this pattern, replace it with this pattern kind of thing. Um, so you've got utilities in there to translate, to search for patterns, to look for stuff, and here's some functions that help you facilitate some of this stuff. Chop variable takes a single argument scalar variable, so chop my name or something, removes the last character from the string value of that variable. So here we have a document, the Perl document, chop doc. A doc is now the Perl doc. Oop. Took the T off the end, so it chopped off one. Uh, chomp removes only a new line character at the end of, of end of the uh, if there if there is one if there's no it doesn't bring it back an error or anything it just doesn't remove anything so a is equal hello world where do you get that from well you get that from when you get input from the keyboard and the user presses in hello world return <laughs> so which is how they're going to get that input in so chomp is actually going to just take off the new line character so it's now hello world so nothing happens if uh, that doesn't exist. And we saw this already, the standard input. We actually have standard output, standard error as well. This comes from C, actually. So it's used when the scalar value is expected. Um, so Perl reads the next complete text line from the standard input up to the first new line character that it receives, and it uses the string as the value. So it's A is equal to standard input. This is like saying, you know, well, actually, you could probably print to the screen before that print. Enter a number between 1 and 10. A is equal to standard input, <laughs> which means go out and get the input from the text and automatically wherever standard input is assigned to, which is kind of interesting. If it's in a local terminal window, it might be the shell. It might be you know, the shell that the user is connected to the system with. However, standard input is directed is where it's coming from. 
So you can use it for remote connections, you can use it for you know, local connections, any type of you know, input. Chomp A, get rid of that pesky new line. Same as chomp A equals standard input. So you can put this inside of the chomp command and actually get the input in and then remove the new line. So you'll see a lot of these commands nested uh, because it automates things a little bit easier. So. And why do they want to get rid of that? Well, what are they leaving in to begin with? Because if you're taking in lines and lines of code or text that's coming in from somewhere, you might want to look for the new line. <laughs> you might want the new line in there because you can check in your loop. Is that a new line character? If it is, the end of the line is reached. So as an example, you've taken a database and you've exported out you know, thousands of records and each one of them shows on a different line <laughs> and they're all comma delimited you can easily sort that and put it into a Perl program like within about seconds. In fact, it's like about two lines of code. It's just searching for the new line and then adding it into an array or into a hash or something. Um, so here's our array examples. A list is an ordered scalar data. So we have a list. An array is a variable that holds that list. So the array is dynamically allocated, not statically, so it's different. And arrays denoted by the A symbols we've seen before. Here's an example. Uh, the array 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, we've got an array of five integers. And uh, we can use some operators and functions with this. So here it is. Fred is 1, 2, 3. Barney is equal to Fred. Copies Fred to Barney. This is not bad. We just copied the whole thing. So if an array variable is assigned to a scalar variable, in this particular case, the number assigned is the length of the array, the number of elements. So if we said that the length is equal to, so we just assign it, we get the length, which is kind of not very intuitive, but it works. You know, so we have three, it actually comes out of that, so three elements in that array. So access a single element with the index values we've seen before, the number inside of the brackets. And note that the A on the array name becomes the just because now it's an element and not an array that we're getting at on the reference. So this is kind of the confusing part. It's kind of like the same thing you had to learn in C or C++. When you've got it in an element, you assign it to a variable. So you can say this element index 0 is equal to this integer i or something. Uh, same concept, but here instead of, because we have no data types, we just put this uh, dollar sign symbol here to say it's a scalar now. It's a single valued instead of the multiple valued array. So uh, it's going to print out the first element, which is 1. Here's the elements for 1, 2, 3. Undefined is returned when accessing an array element beyond the end of the current array, which is good. I wish C or C++ would have something like that, because then we can come back and say, instead of getting garbage, it just says undefined, because it knows how long the array is <laughs> and how many it's dynamically allocated. So, um, so that's not a bad feature. Um, so here we have uh, this particular array name is used to get the index of the last element of the array. And this is the number sign is getting at the index. So when you see the hash sign, <coughs> it's talking about the indexes. This is talking about a scalar. This symbol is talking about an array. So we use the right symbols together, then we can get at the index value of the last index element, which is essentially how many items there are in there. And now we can use arrays and stacks and queues and things as lists. So an array is really just a list. We can sort the list. We can add to the list, subtract from the list. And we can also do like queue and stack operations. And the stack operation is the pop and the push function. Um, so an array is used as a stack of information. You can add something to it, remove something from it. The right hand side of the list, from the right hand side of the list. So. You guys are familiar with the stack concept? No, yeah, most of you. You always figure out, you know, my easiest way of remembering it for those who've never heard of the concept before. It's like a stack of plates. You put them on the shelf. You put one down and one on top of the other, one on top of the other. When you pull them off, no one ever goes to the bottom of the stack because you break them. <laughs> so you put it off the top of the stack. Yeah, and so that's a stack structure. It comes on the same. The putting on and the taking off are on the same end of the structure. So it's a, what is it, last, last, last in, last, last out. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes that plate on the bottom never gets used. <laughs> it just sits there and eventually it gets dirty or something. Versus a queue, when you go to the bank, first person who gets there is the first person who gets served. And if, if they beat you to it, 
in the queue, you end up waiting forever before you get a turn. <laughs> so first in, first out. So they're supported automatically in Perl, so you can automatically just you know create these structures and use it. So you're going to push onto the array my list this new value. Okay, so like my array is now equal to this new value. This new excuse me my my new list is now this old list my list along with this new value. Old value is going to be equal to a pop. So you push this on, you pop it off, you pop off the uh, the list item. So it removes the last element of the list. So push is going to push on whatever element as the uh, last element, and pop is going to take off the last element, off to the same end. So you're actually using a built it's built-in functionality. You don't have to create the push and the pop, which is nice. I wish other languages would actually create the functionality for you. Here's one a lot of C programmers would love to have because if you have an array in C, what are you going to do? You're going to go for loop, move stuff around. You're constantly moving everything around to reorder the list if you can. Here's a shift and an unshift function. So it performs similar action to the pop and a push on the left and on the left side of the list. So instead, actually you could put it in the middle too, but I described a different feature actually. Um, so Fred, 5, 6, and 7, shift, Fred, A. So it puts now, we've got the 5 that's going to, you know, it's going to, it's actually going to use the left instead of the right side. So it's going to treat it more like a queue instead of a stack, actually, a shift. And then an unshift is going to pull it out, so like Fred. So And then when X gets 5 in here, if we shift Fred, he gets moved over. So then Fred is now 6 and 7. So we pushed off the other side shifted off instead of popping and pulling. Uh, sort in reverse. So we can sort it, returns the list in ascending order without changing the original list. So the list is still stored the same way and we're just sorting it and then we're getting the value of that sorted list and using it for something. Reverse is going to take and switch it around the opposite direction. Reverse is the order of the elements. So A is 1, 2, 3. B is equal to reverse A. Now we got reverse and then that uh, means b is equal to 3, 2, 1. So sort it would put it, well, it's already sorted. <laughs> 1, 2, 3. So the sort function actually returns the list in ascending order. Oh, that's a repeat. Uh, chomp function is going to essentially uh, pull off. So this stuff is now hello, hi, hola. So it chomps off the uh, in fact of the list. We saw this chomp being used with a scalar. Now it applied to the array. This stuff in my array is going to pull off for each element in the array. It's going to pull off the new line character instead of just the single. If this were array, so basically it's the same function, but we're applying it to an array instead of a scalar. So it comes in handy. In fact, there's a lot of consistency with Perl as a language that way. So. Uh, filtering a list. Here we go. So grab function uh, may be used to select from the list. Um, so here we have toys array. Um, what do we have here? We have cars, race cars, truck, blue car, train. Now we're going to grep car from toys array. So we can use the Unix, Unix grep in the QW. We can print it out. We can grep from a list. Demons equal grep demons. So the name of a text file. So we can filter out as well to kind of sort, search, filter. Use built in. In fact, actually, that's one of the interesting things about Perl. I thought I probably should mention at this point. Um, it supports most of the Unix utilities and commands <laughs> as well. It's a Unix scripting language designed for system administrators in Unix. So it's going to obviously it's going to support everything. And it also supports C and C like languages. So iterating through an array is this example C style for looping. You know, the four. This variable i is equal to zero, i is less than, array value, the, the size of the array, excuse me, the array, i plus plus, and go through, you know, i is a value, substitute it in. Or you can do the for each, which is kind of different. So it supports the C type and also supports this is more of the um, Pascali type or something. Uh, for each element in the array, print something out, print the element out. Um, so you're not stuck with just the. Uh, you're not stuck with just the for loop. In fact, there's actually more looping. This is just a subset of all the features that are available. So in a list context, the standard input returns all the remaining lines up to the end of the file. 
Um, so if you had a file let's say, so each line is returned as a separate element in the list. So if we said that the array A is equal to standard input, reads the standard input into the list context. Same thing as before, we had a scalar variable there, but now it's going to read multiple lines until a blank line is actually put in. So. And uh, argument values. So the array contains command line arguments. You see this? Actually, this is terminology that's usually used in like C command line arguments that are done for uh, switches, and parameters that are entered in a command line when running a C program. So it doesn't include program name. So here we have, um, this is automatically put in. So you type in the name of your Perl program and you type in these command line arguments. It's going to come in the same way it does normally when it comes into main on a C program. But now you have the argument values. So zero contains the program name, and uh, the arguments doesn't contain it. So use a scalar context to determine the arguments. So if the arguments is you know, not equal to two, you know, put a little message out and says, hey, you have to put in the name of the file plus the output file or something. You have to put in both pieces. So you can add messages by counting up, let's say, the number of argument values that are received. And Perl as a language also supports the hashes concept. Hashes are collected of, uh, we actually looked at a couple of them already, key values. Um, so they're scalar data with individual elements selected by some index. And the index is not a number, it's a, it's a name of a particular variable. So index values are arbitrarily scalars called keys. So we have key value, key value, key value. It's just like an array, but it's in key value sets, um, which gives us our dictionaries, actually. It gives us a look at. The element in hash has no special order to it. Different than the list, actually. The arrays have an order to them. Hashes don't have an order. So we just add a bunch of stuff to the dictionary, and then we can ask for a key, and we can get a value, which isn't bad. Elements of the hash are referenced by the hash name and then the key that's associated with it. So here are some examples. Examples, and then the hash actually, as mentioned before, this is kind of reiterating the point. We've got this symbol here to say we're using a hash. And this is the percent. So we have car color. So Buick is yellow. All the Buicks out there are yellow. <laughs> so my color, car color Buick. Well, my color is now yellow. Because we said assign to this variable my color, and it's a scalar, and it's going to be equal to the scalar of Buick. So instead of using the 0, 1, 2, 3 the index values in here, we're using the key, the, the key or not the key, the, yes, the key. <laughs> we're using the key. And we're getting the value associated with this key. So Buick is like a zero in this particular case. And then we have this new hash copy, which is equals to the original, uh, which is the original hash. So copy one original to a copy. So we can copy one hash to another hash. Just the same way as we copied one array to another array, we can do it with hashes as well. And just as a common rule, just to reiterate, reiterate the point, all commands are usually fairly consistent among all features. So if you can copy a, an array, you can copy a hash, or you can copy a scalar. So using this operator here, uh, it does an automatic assignment for us. So we have this car color, Buick yellow, what's that, GE red, Nissan blue. <laughs> so, I don't know, we have a car called GE these days, I don't know. Anyway, it's just a value that was put in. So. So it's an easier way of assigning the values. In fact, you can, you know, probably put together a huge, like, hundreds of these, put them all together in the same hash. So key functions, in terms of the hash functions and the capabilities, the keys of the hash name, so we put in the name of the hash name and we say, and run the function keys, yields a list of all of the current keys in the hash name. Because here's the interesting thing, we have this huge dictionary, but what's in it? <laughs> So we have to find out what key do we want so we can get the value. We run a keys function and gives us it. And it's a built-in function for that. And example keys hash name is equal to keys and then the hash name. So once for each one of the keys, so for Fred, for, the, for each key, keys Fred, give me once one in list of each one of them. So prints a key, we have Fred key the value here. So it shows the key and the value. So hash keys, uh, order of keys is unpredictable. So we don't know, it's not in alphabetical order, it's not in, it's not even in the order that we put them in. 
which is interesting. So we can use a special environment hash which stores environment variables. This should look familiar. This is what we get in Unix. We have the environment we add. In fact, we'll be talking about this next week when we'll start looking at shells. Because a lot of the utility of shells is to be able to create environment variables and use the environment variables, pass them before between different programs, and they have different utility to them. So print the environment variable for shell, prints out, well, here's the shell. So Perl can be used for built-in system utility commands, for talking to the kernel, talking to the interface, um, without having to go through any type of API, essentially. It runs directly through system calls and from scripting languages. Excuse me, shell scripting that's native to Unix. So it's a very much so a Unix utility. A values function, just like the keys function, yields a list of the current values as well, in the same order as the keys returned by the keys, whichever order that might happen to be. Um, so last name is Barney Flintstone. We got Barney Flintstones, Gary Smith, Jerry Smith. Um, this is essentially grabs the values that are associated with the values of this particular last names. So. The each function, so each hash name returns a key value pair of the two elements in the list. So instead of just getting the keys, we're just getting the values, we just say each. And we can use each in a loop here. So while this equals each of them, <laughs> then print out the information to the screen. So we get the pair, essentially returns the key value pair as a list element, used to iter reiterate or iterate through over an entire hash, examining every element. So um, this is where we get the for, for each loop, but here we just use the each because we we're not going to actually do the for loop at the same time. The for each is essentially an automation of this using a for loop instead of a while. So, and here we just switched it around and said a while, you know, this is equal to the, well this is equal to this, you know, assign it out essentially until we run out of eaches when the list is over with the loop ends. Um, delete removes hash elements and takes a hash reference as an argument. So delete Barney will get rid of the key value pair. So it takes the the key value pair, removes it from the list. So checking the hash keys or the values. So checking for a true false value. If uh, employee John is he in there, check to see uh, existing keys if it exists. So we can check the value of John. We can check to see if he exists in there. We can also check to see uh, if the existing key in a has a defined value. Is defined John? Does he have a, a value in there? Because what you could do is create some keys and then associate some values to the keys. And then you can, might have some keys that don't have any values. And so you can check to see if there is a value that's associated. You're wondering, when am I ever going to use this? If you're processing a list of information, <laughs> you might... This is very kind of useful for list processing. Unless you do a lot of list processing, you may not necessarily have ever used Perl or ever had an opportunity to experiment with it, but it comes in handy. Um, so checking hash keys or values continuing along with this undefined value. Is it undefined? You can delete a value. You can check to see if the value contains anything. Is it empty? No, it, it has it been. Well, this is kind of the same, similar as is it, is it defined, um, but if it's defined or whether or not it's defined but doesn't have a value associated with it would make it empty. So We have control structures as well, supports the if, the for, while, the for, the while, similar to those in C. We've seen a couple of them already. And then the for each construct is from the C shell. And we'll take a look at more of that in uh, next week's shell scripting uh, lecture. But the for each example is kind of used a lot because... Um, people who are using Perl are generally shell scripters. It's a, it's, it's, Perl is sort of like a shell scripting language, but it's more feature rich and has more module support. There's a Perl module for practically everything out there. And most of you are like, what's a module? As an example, you're doing video translation, you're going from a, one format to another, you're doing our music translation, you're taking something from a wave and translating it into an mp3 file. There's a module for that. <laughs> There's modules for um, encryption, decryption, security stuff. There's a module for checking ports, looking at activities, system administrative modules and tools, module interfaces for working with other languages. 
along with Perl. Um, all sorts of different utilities that might be associated. Um, it's kind of Perl's being one of those fix all languages, kind of like C used to be. But it's a scripting language, so it's not. C is a compiled language, unless you're running C shell, you know, she script. So. She sells, she sells on the seashore. <laughs> That's what it reminded me of. Hey, I'm getting used to I've been saying it all this, I've been saying it for like the last year. I'm actually getting it. <laughs> I can actually say it now. Okay, so the for each of the list, uh, if the list we are iterating over is made of real variables that rather than some functions, uh, listing the values, we can list them out. For each one of the variables in the list, we can print out the associated information. Here's an example. Now we have an array of numbers, 3, 5, 7, and 9. For each one here of the numbers, 1 is going to be equal to this number times 3. So it's very C-like syntax, actually. So the numbers are now 3 times 3, 3 times 5, 7 times 3, and 9 times 3, essentially. Basic I.O., as we've seen before, we uses the standard input. Um, Perl uses the variable dollar sign underscore to contain the line read from standard input. So it reads the next line. reads all lines until control D um, might be put in. So if we want a single line, we use the variable. If we want all lines, we use the array. And each line gets into a new array item, uh, which is interesting. Uh, different than some of the other languages. Typically, while define line is equal to uh, a typical example here, uh, while it's equal to standard input, while we have standard input, then process something, do something with each one of the lines. Then, no more lines are read, then that one becomes, you know, it returns an undefined because there's nothing in there, essentially. It's empty. Using the diamond operator, looks like a diamond. Or less than or greater than operator, the diamond operator. Operates like the standard input, but gets data from files. So, file or files, multiple. So, specified on the Perl command line, invokes Perl program. So, this looks like the, uh, looks at the argument for the, uh, so you typed in the name of your program, space, command line argument values. Reads it in, so while, read it in. So, this is an example of one, two, three lines of code to op find a file, open it up, read in the contents. <laughs> and assuming that you copied this into a text file, you made the text file executable, and you typed in the executable name of the file, space the name of the file, because so, it needs it on the command line argument. So it reads directly from the command line argument for you, which automates the process. And then, you know, this is basically printing it out. Output to the standard output, print for normal output, printed for formatting output, and uh, regular expressions. So Perl supports the same regular expression as said. Um, the equals kind of similar to like matching operator. Um, actually, another note here to say you can also read to and write to standard error, read in from standard error, and redirect output as well. So, in that should hopefully look familiar in terms of the concept of standard in, standard out, which is the basis for C, STDIO, standard input, standard output. So it's essentially the same functionality, but you're working with it a little bit closer than going through an API, going through a, you know, some C language interpreter. Instead, you're just reading and writing, and that's actually the Unix input output that the C wrapper is actually working on. When you, when you use that API, it's actually a wrapper on top of the system calls on top of the standard input output error. <laughs> so it's pretty high up. This is actually lower level, believe it or not. Not like low level like assembly language, but it's a low level like scripting language. It's really nice. Uh, so it takes regular expression operators on the right side and changes the target of the operator to some value. So here we have print out, uh, print out something from the screen depending upon if something is yes or no. Split function. This comes in really handy. In fact, this is the concept was actually kind of implemented in a lot of other scripting languages as well, JavaScript being one of them. Um, the script function takes the regular expression and a string and looks for all occurrences of the regular expression with the string. And then parts of the string that don't match the regular expression are returned in sequences of the list. So it's uh, delimiting a list, splitting it out by a comma. So you've got a Going back to the example of those thousands of records that came from a database export, now it's in a dumped text file. Well, you can write a Perl program to read all that stuff in, sort it out, create a dictionary out of it, and use it 
in a program. So you can make use out of that data dump, essentially, which is why Perl is actually kind of popular. It kind of comes in handy for stuff like this. And maybe it's comma delimited, maybe it's space delimited. I mean, whatever the delimiter is, just split it out, essentially. Make it into a sorted list. So here's our line. Looks like a URL or something here. Yeah. Here's our field. Split it by this here. So now it's our delimiter. So now our field is Marianne, uh, 118, 120, <laughs> Randall, essentially, and then the home address. Nice. No looping. I forgot I had water. I'm like, yeah, it's getting a dry mouth. <coughs> now I'm gonna cough. Join <coughs> takes the list of values and glues them to another list. Um, <coughs> glue with a string between each list element. And here we have a gluing with this particular string element. So here's an example outline. Join this with these fields. <coughs> so it glues them together with a string between each one of the elements. And then define a user function. So we've seen some built-in functions so far. Now you can write your own user function. So here's a sub, sub name, which is sub is kind of short for the concept of a sub program, which is really a function, programming language concepts. Um, so it could call it function, but it really isn't. It's called sub instead. Statement one, statement two, statement three. Anyway, it returns the value of the <coughs> return value is the value of the return statement or the last expression evaluated by the subroutine. So you don't actually have to return a value, it does it automatically for you. So if it equates down to something in the last statement, number three, that's the value, like five, then five gets returned from it. So it's kind of like taking, and you're doing some processing here, you go to the function and you do some processing over here, and it's all blended together. <laughs> so there's no pass and return, pass and return, like there is in C or C++, because there's no stack, and there's no compilation, and there's no memory. So it's all being, uh, the memory is of environment variables, and it's the Unix platform, and there's no, there's no running stack. In fact, instead it's sequential line by line execution, like any other script language, scripting language. So it's just going to go here, and then that's why they call it subprogram, subroutine, up, go over here, come back over here, <laughs> go over here. So you're just moving, and you're not, because you then you can back up here, come back down here. It's kind of like the go-tos, the go-to days. So. Which is nice because you don't have that passing stuff. So, calling a function or a subroutine, my routine with some parameters, you can pass. Yes? I'm sorry, one more, one more time? Uh, the proxy attendance. Attendance? Yeah. What, what, what are you can talking we about? Stop it? Can we stop? Yeah. Are you talking about Perl or are you talking about the class? Because I see the attendance sheet is just going on. Oh, I see what you're talking about. It's disturbing you. Huh? I mean, they just walk in. I know. They saw the attendance, and then they walk out. And your your suggestion was just to stop that completely? Yeah. Let's stop it then. Yeah, stop the attendance. <laughs> Settled. <laughs> it's distracting me sometimes. I look around, and I was like, oh, okay, where's the, what's going on over there? And I look, and I see, I see the sheet. It actually bounces. It goes from this side to this side to that side, and it comes around. Ah, it's just stuff. If, if, if people are just coming in to sign the attendance, then what's the sense in that? And if you haven't noticed, I don't actually grade on attendance. So. Thank you for the suggestion. My interruption. Not about Perl, but we can make it into Perl. We could make a Perl program <laughs> that tracked attendance, <laughs> took the list, crossed it with all of the other lists of all the days. We'd have to put a timer on how long the person stayed after they signed the attendance. <laughs> and then I could grade on attendance. <laughs> all right, now if it's going around, it seems to be distracting. So where is the list anyway? Who's got the list? Oh, where, where, where's the TA? Up there. Can you get the list of the TA, please? Yes. When you're all done with it? After you sign it? Oh, <laughs> you're going to sign it? Oh, you know what? It's too confusing. Just let it go. I'll fix it next term. 
Just let it go. It's okay. Just let it go. If you want to sign it, sign it. Just don't do it discreetly. <laughs> Next turn, we'll have a new process for that. And there's something new. Something has to change with that. So we're going to we're going to change it. Excuse me. Biometrics. I could yeah scan your eyes or something or your <laughs> fingerprints. <laughs> But then your fingerprints would have to stay in the room constantly. The problem is people abuse the policy. They go and they sign the list and then they leave. So, I don't know. Anyway, back to Perl. We'll revisit that concept next term. What was I talking about? Functions and subroutines. An array is equal to a my routine parameter. So, using calling a function my routine. So, function argument. So, yeah, that's what I was talking about. As I mentioned before, we don't have to send it arguments, but we can send it arguments. We can send it parameters, and we can have we can pass back and forth. We can specify a return value as well, although we don't have to. That's the point I was trying to make. Uh, subroutine invocation is following by a list with parameters, so causing the list to be automatically assigned to a special variable named. So this at of the underscore for the duration of the subroutine. The underscore zero is the first element of the array. So what we do is we specify we're using the underscore. We can actually use the parameter list. So using my operator uh, in terms of function private variables. So as I mentioned before, we have sort of this sequential going down this way, going over here, coming back, and jumping through. We can create a CC++, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas <laughs> function mentality and just have my, uh, in terms of that subroutine, that has its own special variables. When the function's over, the variables go away, we don't see it back over if the rest is part of the program. So they pretty much refer to it as private variables. So my son makes some a local variable for each, uh, uh, in terms of, where's my in here? Uh, for each of these that we're taking in, we're using the underscore saying it's coming in through the command line argument. Add the expression or add each element to it and then return to some the last expression evaluated. So, oh, here it is. The I'm like, I was so distracted. <laughs> my train of thought's lost. <laughs> okay, so the my preceded by the a variable initialization or variable declaration, I should say. So it creates a local variable. But it is essentially not going to leave the function. So semi private variables. A little different. We have private, now we have semi-private. Variables using a local. Uh, so the keyword is local instead of my. Local variables are visible to the function called from within the block in which those variables are declared. So there's a block, so it's semi, you know, it left the main part of the program, it went to the function, but it came back to that little block. It's not good for the entire program, so it's semi-function. Sem semi-private, I should say. Uh, requiring variable declarations, so programmers may choose to require the declaration, which you don't have to do, but some people are in the practice of doing that and they want to. So you use strict or you use strict vars, vars. So the compiler will be strict in requiring, in fact, you use strict in terms of where it says uh, my, you know, when you at the top of the header, where you can suppress the warnings, you can use uh, you can use strict, you can, you know, essentially set the environment for which you want to run this program with. If um, the compiler will be strict in requiring that variables must be declared private with my, otherwise variables must be qualified with package names. So, it depends on uh, if you want to require the particular script to, to basically conform to variable assignments, or, excuse me, variable declarations. Uh, function arguments. So passing the argument score, and then we have just the same way as we'd normally see in other types of functions in other languages. We usually have brackets with a list separated by commas in terms of each one of the parameters. Passing parameters, uh, references to arrays, passing hashes, uh, done in a, a very similar way, passing references to hashes. So. Signal handling. There's another reason why Perl is actually kind of popular. It works with uh, the native Unix signal handling and knows all of the signals. The same way as it works with the environment variables, we can pull out and use environment variables as if they were 
variables of the Perl script, essentially, because we have access to them, uh, which we don't normally would have in like another type of language. Um, so the special here, the hash of the dollar sign sig, which is the signal handler and the signals that are coming through are hashes used for signal handling. So the hash keys are signal names, and these are some common ones. Um, hash values are signal decisions. So in terms of this signal, ignore it. This one, you use the default to catch it, do something with it. So we assign a hash of this signal ID with this this behavior that we want to happen, this action to take if this particular signal occurs. So we can kind of write a signal handler kind of program if we wanted to, to kind of deal with the capturing. That's very low level if you think about it. It's like C programming working with, but you're not working with a system call interface, instead you're working with a Unix operating system, which is why Perl again is kind of a popular language. Uh, file handles. As we've seen so far, recommended use of all of the uppercase letters in your file handles. So standard in, standard out, uh, input, output, and error, as I mentioned before. This is the new one you haven't seen yet. Uh, so standard error. If you use the uppercase letters uh, for the naming, it's easier to see it. So it stands out more. Uh, opening a file for reading. Open the file handle. One of those file handles are input, output, error, and you know, it's going to be input maybe, file name. So die is equivalent to open that file or die. <laughs> open a file or end the script right now because you can't proceed if you don't open up the file. Uh, so it's kind of like the try, try and catch if you think about it that way. Uh, opening a file for writing using the, and this should look familiar, so the di directional operator has we could possibly redirect the input to something else or the output to a file or something. Um, we can use the indirection operators, actually. Um, and here we have a to append. I have a, oh, you know, or this is the or. Excuse me. Open this file. Or sorry, couldn't create the file name or something. So writing to a file, noting that a comma after the file handler is uh, is used. Actually, this is the other interesting thing too, as well. We have the ability to call this as a function or to leave out the brackets. So we could actually put in print and then put brackets in here. And the modern, depends on the version of the Perl interpreter. The older ones will complain, the newer ones won't do it. They'll just leave it alone. Or you could just leave it out and just say, hey, print this out, file handle, hello world. Uh, no comma after the file name. You're not separating anything out, I should say. Before I said that there was a comma, I meant to say there's no comma after the file name. So provides a dot um, op file test just like the shells do. So. In fact, it does the same operation as the shell when you open a file. Same operation for the redirection as well. So, so to capture command output, use the command substitution. If you want to, capturing the output in a scalar. Here we have uh, the uh, variable is equal to who. Ah, this, you know, if you type it from a terminal prompt who, it's going to tell you who's logged in right now. <coughs> And the command will actually be so captured to the variable. This is very Perlish, and again, another reason why Perl is a popular system is <laughs> uh, Unix administrators' uh, language of choice because you don't have to go and say system space who you know you don't have to run the who command, take the output from the who command, copy it to a string, take the string, copy it to you know you, there's no manipulation. You just say, well, just run who and copy the output to this variable and then you can save it or take this who and use it to then just go who am I who could be any type of Unix command ls could be anything and then use it somehow so capturing the output in an array put it in an array let's say you had ls you probably want to put that in, in an array because then you get all the files that are in the directory to execute the command without capturing the output use system and system essentially is a low-level system called a runner program. People who write shells sometimes execute system. It's kind of like doing an exec, which is, you know, after a fork, it's just going to run a program and then die after it's done running. So. Reading directory files. And this is a good reference to actually kind of keep in mind. There's a thing called a Perl cookbook. So if you go online, it's actually called that. If you go online, uh, go to Google and type in Perl space cookbook you're going to get like this 600 page <laughs> cookbook <laughs> has a bunch of script suggestions, utilities, 
And it's called a cookbook because it's kind of like recipes. Here's how to read a file. Here's how to write a file. Here's how to run a system backup. Here's how to um, report on who's logged in right now. Here's how to glue this program together with that program. And so here's how to translate an MP3 file or WAV file into an MP3 file. And they're pre-made kind of scripts that you can kind of customize, which is not bad. But in turn, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just take what has been working, and you can pretty much you know, get up to speed real quick with it. So you can use Open Directory here to set up a directory handle. Um, open Directory is going to be a utility that's going to be used to you know, open it up or die. Use a Read Directory or Scalar Text to read in the next entry so while something read it in. Read directory lists all the contents that are read on all of the entries. Um, other, and you know, for the purposes of this course, you don't actually have to know any of these commands or anything in the cookbook or anything. In fact, all you have to do is write down one little Perl CGI thing and it's it's as easy as hello world. I mean, it's not too bad. But uh, what this is, uh, this lecture is intended to do is kind of give you an overview of the features of the language, so what makes it different than some other scripting languages, what makes it unique, why it's, why it's being used, essentially, how it relates to Unix. Uh, user database manipulation. So most Unix systems have standard libraries called DBMs, and there's a database library, actually works with Perl, which allows programmers to store a collection and going back to that hash that we looked at, the key value pairs into a pair of disk files. So it's kind of a permanent, persistent hash that stays in, in terms of the environment. So in Perl, a hash may be associated with a DBM through the process similar to opening up a file. So we say, you know, database management open function to associate DBM with a database array. And then we can have database features in our Perl program, built in which we don't get in like C or C++ or Java or something like that, or shell scripts. So we'll open this array name, open this database, copy it to an array name, you know, specify the mode as read, write, uh, and that looks, should look familiar maybe. Uh, read, write, execute for each one of the, of the different privileges. Uh, delete this person, you know, do that, print something out, you know, use it like a database essentially. In terms of Perl debugging, I mentioned some of this already. The minus D gives you debug information. X, the H, prints out help messages. The T gives you the stack trace. S for whoa, single steps. Actually, it traces this S belongs in the beginning. <laughs> uh, probably this, le this lecture needs some editing, obviously. Uh, prints out the single steps to the trace. <laughs> so N for next, finish. Anyway. All of these different kind of switches will, uh, will help you with that. As I mentioned before, Perl is really good for running system calls without actually having to open up a formal programming language to do it. You can run the system call directly in Perl. So it provides an interface to many of the different system call uh, utilities. Interface is via Perl functions, not directly through the system call library. So again, it's a higher level API, but it automates the system calls for us. And the interface use is dependent on the implementation and the version of Perl being used. And there are about 20 different versions of Perl out there. That's why I say some of the versions support different things than others. So it's kind of like when you uh, decide you're going to use Perl, then you decide on what version. And, then, and actually what you decide on is, what has my company installed on the server? <laughs> and that determines what version you're going to use because you have to have the server support and if your company doesn't have it installed, you're going to have to have them install it, if you can. Perl's cheap. It's free. It's an open source language. It's, you know, it's not something that's expensive. Problem is configuring it, upgrading it, supporting it, making it available. <laughs> and uh, that's the problem. Well, it's kind of like, you know, if you've got an Apache server, you've probably got Perl in there already. Because most likely, and just like on the MacBooks, it's basic Unix core, B, even BSD Unix uses it, some of the Unix utilities are run in Perl. So it's going to be there. So what version is the question? So Perl modules may uh, export symbols to your namespace. May, uh, you can start with the use command to import symbols. Use CGI, use MP3, something. Uh, so may request only certain symbols be imported. Use CGI and use one and two, symbols one and two or something. 
So in terms of steps in making a module, I'm not going to actually go through it, but you can compile your own Perl modules. And what makes the language really efficient is how easily extendable it is. So you can create a Perl module, you can distribute it out in open source, people can download the module. So sometimes when you run like system updates on a Unix system, you see Perl this, Perl that. <laughs> it's updating your modules essentially. There's a new version of this module out, there's a new version of that one out. And these modules are helping you uh, support printing functions, perhaps, um, display colors, uh, all sorts of different things that are associated with the operating system in terms of utilities that are written in Perl. Because the base Unix system is going to be using Perl for the most part. I mean, not for everything, but some of the utilities are written in Perl. Uh, module name should uh, not be uh, all lowercase, so usually uppercase. Uh, module file packages should be matched, hopefully. So. Steps in making, uh, we don't have to worry about that. Let's skip through the steps in making a module. But um, what I just gave you is kind of an overview of the entire Perl language. Obviously, you're not going to learn the entire Perl language in one short lecture. In fact, you probably could take an entire course in Perl programming. Eh, scripting languages. But this is a Unix class. <laughs> so, but one of the assignments, and uh, for those of you who walked in late, it's the first assignment that is going to require you to use Perl in a CGI interface and as I mentioned before unless you've got a ton of money and a Unix server and Apache and a CGI module installed and Perl installed you're probably never going to see this work but you can put the pieces together and pretend and the page will actually load it just won't populate with the data because it won't actually run the Perl commands unless you've got Perl installed. You could possibly get it to work on a MacBook, actually. But you got to install it. I don't think Apache's installed on that. I don't know if I'd want to. I don't know if I'd want to ruin my system. <laughs> I don't think you got a full Apache server that's going to support it. You have Perl, but the problem is you're not going to have the CGI interface or the Apache web services on there. You need the, you need the web the full web package, which I don't think you're going to get. Even if you have a partial, that's the interesting thing about Apache. It's also in modules. <laughs> so you might have parts and pieces of Apache on there, but you might not have the whole thing. I wouldn't bother because you're going to install a bunch of stuff that's going to be a bear to uninstall. And it's kind of like when I tried to put Oracle on my uh, MacBook. And uh, I had to basically upgrade my operating system eventually anyway, but I could never get rid of it. it. Installed stuff all over the place. I had pieces of Oracle on there until I upgraded that operating system. <laughs> so I don't recommend doing it. You don't have to do it. You can mimic it, pretend. And for those who came in really late and have been missing the last couple weeks, you only have to do three of the four projects. You don't have to do all four. And for those of you who came in really, really, really late, and for those of you watching this video at home, you can probably stop it at this point. And for those of you who have already seen all this stuff, you can probably go home at this point. <laughs> but I have put out the final exam schedule for those of you who haven't seen this yet. It's not on the website yet. I'm going to have the uh, TAs send it out essentially this week sometime. No groups, which means you, you don't have to worry about your last name. Instead, this is the recommended schedule to show up for the HTML for the Unix. Unix is going to be on 8.15. If you want to take the Unix exam on 8.8, .8, you can. Just show up for it. If you want to come in and take all exams on the same day, you can do that as well. A lot, maybe an hour and a half to two hours for each exam because you don't want to cut yourself short. Maybe take a break in between, maybe, if you're going to do multiple at the same time. You don't have to get pre-approved. You don't have to send me an email message asking for a new date or a new time. I don't have to know the time. Show up between 9 o'clock a.m. and 5 o'clock p.m. We're going to cut it off at 5. You'll have to show up the next day, or not the next day, the next week. Only on Monday, only on Wednesday. If you have questions, you can send them, or wait, you can ask me when we're done, or you can ask them right now. The deadline for everything is August 16th. And next week we'll be talking about shell scripting. We're done. <laughs> Enjoy. Thank you. Hi, welcome. <laughs>